Thank you. And I'm here to introduce this document to you, but just for reference, how many of you have already downloaded and looked at the document? Uh, good, more than half of the people in the room. So this is a really introductory presentation and I expect that you will have questions that go beyond what I have put on my slides. My slides only take about half an hour. I'm happy to answer questions as we go along, but sometimes it's easier to, to get the perspective for the people who haven't seen it and then go into the details a little later. So we'll have plenty of time for conversation. If there's something you really feel you need to ask as we go along, don't hesitate to raise your hand. I can stop and deal with that too. But uh, there will be plenty of time for questions. So let me just begin with the slides. This project was envisioned and funded by the Carnegie Corporation for New York. And we all need to be very grateful to them. Basically what Carnegie did was said, look, we have common core standards in math and language arts. What's going to happen for science? And how can we do that and do it better? And they came to the Board on Science Education asked us one night over dinner, uh, could we do this in a year? And being foolish, we said yes. <laughs> it took us a year and a half, which by academy standards is really fast. The committee was, was met first in January last year, and the final product is now released. Uh, the vision behind this document, and one needs to be very clear about that as one reads the document, is this is about science for all students. This is not about what some students should learn. This is about what all students should learn. And I hope everybody in this room feels comfortable with and shares that vision that there is science in depth that everybody needs to know for their life. And I put at the bottom national need, there's a lot of stress publicly these days on we need more scientists and engineers, we need more scientifically and technically competent workers at every level. And, but I think we also need more people who are comfortable and competent to use their knowledge about science to interpret things they meet in their everyday life. And that's really a goal behind this work. Uh, why do we need a framework now? Well, I already mentioned the special opportunity that common standards give us. The common standards in science will give power to the multiple states that we hope will adopt these standards to work together for better assessments, for better curriculum materials, for all the things you need to actually do a good science program in the classroom. Uh, uh, but also, the work that Elizabeth was talking about, the National Science Education Standards and a year before it, the Benchmarks for Science Literacy and the work that AAAS did, uh, is 15 years ago. And we have research on learning that's happened during this time, and we have changes in science and changes in the world that have happened during this time. So it's time to do it again. And we should never think of it as being done once and for all. It it's actually should be... a a process which has a regular process of, of updating and improvement based on what we know about how it worked and didn't work and what we got right and what we got wrong in doing it this time I hope can be corrected before we have to wait 15 years in fact. So what is a framework? A framework is not a curriculum. It is not a set of standards. It is simply an outline of what it is students need to know in order to take that outline and develop standards. And I hope also to develop curriculum materials, assessments, all the other pieces you need to make the system coherent and aligned with a single vision. So it's a vision of what science education should look like. The goals are that students should learn over multiple years coherently develop their understanding of the big ideas of science. And that's not really the way curriculum generally works today. They switch from one topic to another without much connective tissue. And so this is an important part of the vision. And the other part of the vision, which is equally important, in the language of the field people talk about inquiry learning, they talk about learning 
by doing, they talk about hands-on. We took that and changed it a little into a vision of science practice. We say, this is what scientists do, and this is what students should do in order to understand what science is, and in order to gain the in-depth understanding of their ideas. So we're building on a viewpoint that is based on research on learning, and based on a perspective on what works to give students a rich understanding of science. And, and so there's, a, there's very definitely an attitude behind this document about what, what matters in learning. We were given the task as, as described on this slide. Notice it says articulate how the uh, core and cross-cutting ideas uh, intersect at, at at least three grade levels. The committee chose to do four for two reasons. One, we wanted to stress that science shouldn't wait it should start K2. It's not something you should start in fourth grade or sixth grade or sometime later. So we wanted to put some endpoints, some things we think students should have done by the time they're in second grade, as well as the ones we think they should be able to do by the time they're in fifth grade. And develop some guidance on how the pieces go together. And that's important too, and I'll come back to that. So. Examples of performance expectations that when you ask a student to demonstrate their knowledge, they should be demonstrating not just that they know a list of facts, but something more than that. This is a list of the committee members. It's on the document, it's on the web. The only thing I put it up there for is to point out that it's kind of an evenly divided, divided committee. Nine of the committee members were members of the National Academy in either science or engineering two of them Nobel Prize winners. So we had a strong group of scientists covering pretty much all the disciplines of the natural sciences. And we had nine other members who have a background in education, either coming from the classroom and being people who have become district administrators or state administrators or moved into being teacher, working in teacher education or uh, researchers in the learning sciences. So these are people who bring the education perspective put together with the people who come with the science perspective to together decide what is it important for students to learn. We also had these groups we called design teams. To do a project on the fast schedule we were working on, we needed more than a volunteer committee. Committees are wonderful and they do a lot of very deep thinking and engage very much with the work. But to get work done fast, you need somebody who has a commitment to spending a certain amount of time writing early on. And that meant we needed some consultants. So the design teams are our consultants for developing the content area, the disciplinary area, expertise and input that we needed to jumpstart the process. Now, one of the first decisions, really, I made was this is the structure of the four design teams, physical science, life science, earth and space science, and one called engineering technology and applications of science. Because when you ask scientists what is the core knowledge of their discipline, they totally ignore the applications of that knowledge in the world we live in. But or pretty much totally ignore it. And yet for kids, what's interesting about science is often how it plays out in the world around them and how it's useful in medicine or engineering or other fields which are not, quote, pure science. So to be sure that we kept that emphasis in the document, I put a fourth team there and that led to features of the work which make it a little bit different from prior documents. Although I must say, prior documents had this element too, and it was much ignored in application. So the question of what this will mean for what happens in the end, we still have to see. But I think it's more integrated deeply into the document than it has been previously. And I think this will be an important aspect. So we'll come back and talk about that. As I said, 
we we began well there was a stakeholder meeting this really before the study was it was after the stakeholder meeting that Carnegie asked us to do the project and the stakeholder meeting was bringing together people from science and the learning sciences again to talk about could we define a, a limited set of core ideas and say this is the central ideas of the disciplines and coming out of that it was also this idea that there are core ideas of the disciplines but there are also core ideas of science that cross there are cross-cutting concepts that matter across all disciplines and so and then the committee met in January we had four meetings in a very rapid time scale we put out a draft we knew it was primitive but we wanted the input from the field so we put out a draft July last year after only four months of work, that's amazing for an, <laughs> an academy committee, particularly because we had to go through an internal academy review before we could put out that draft even. We got a lot of input. We got about 2,000 people answering via our website. We held multiple focus groups with organizations like the Council of State, Super State Science Supervisors organizing regional meetings around the country, NSTA holding some focus groups and then more specifically the American Association of Physics teachers or chemistry teachers were meeting to review and comment on the document from the perspective of the different practitioner groups and we also asked a lot of individuals to send us their individual comments and based on all that input we did really substantial revision of the document partly it's a matter of us trying to figure out, well, if we're going to have a framework and standards, what belongs in the framework and what belongs in the standards? And, and so some of the, it was, was us gaining more clarity on what a framework should be, but a lot of it was really detailed input from the field about what belonged where or how we said something that really helped us formulate what I think is a much stronger final document. And then we had two more committee meetings we actually, as a committee, finished the report last February. The process from February to July was a very stringent review internally to the National Academy. So a committee of 18, we had 21 reviewers, more or less reflecting the makeup of the committee. And uh, the, the Academy's review process is the committee, committee leadership has to decide how to change the report in response to review. We have to make a matrix. Every comment, what we're going to do about it. We had 95 pages of response to review to figure out what it was, what they told us and what we'd done and why we'd done it or hadn't done what the, what the reviewers suggested. So that was a lot of work too. And then because there was that much of it, they sent it back to eight reviewers to re-review it, and we, then we had to comment on that. So that's why it took from, Feb from February to middle of July before we could have a public release and get the document out for you all to see and begin, I hope, to use, as well as for Achieve, who is the other organization Carnegie has funded, to coordinate the process of producing a set of standards which we hope multiple states will adopt. Achieve, by the way, asked for states to apply to be partners in that process, hoping to get about six states. They have 20 states who have applied to be partners in the process. I don't know whether California is on that list or not. I think they might be, but I really don't know. So the question of how ACHIEVE is going to work with the states got more complicated when there were 20 wanting to do it. They, they had thought they were optimistic thinking they'd get sick who wanted to do the work of being part of the process. But they also have developed writing teams. They have started their work already in terms of the consultants beginning to decide how they're going to formulate items and what aspects of this they're going, how they're going to follow the framework because they really very much want their, their standards to reflect what's in our framework. Okay, what is the framework? It's got three parts. The first part is kind of introductory, telling, telling you some of the things I've told you already, telling you what's our vision for science education and what assumptions we make as we start the work. Part two is really the framework itself, which has three dimensions. I'll come to that in a moment. And part three is a lot of discussion of what it takes for the vision that's behind this framework 
to actually play out in the classroom. And it doesn't just take standards, it takes curriculum materials, it takes teacher professional development, it takes uh, assessments that match the vision. So all of these pieces we discuss in the later parts of the framework. The three dimensions are science and engineering practice, cross-cutting concepts, those big ideas that don't belong to any particular discipline but matter for all of science, and the disciplinary core ideas. I like the metaphor of dimensions because what it says is a solid science lesson lives in all three dimensions. It's not one piece or another piece, it's all of them together that makes for a real learning in science. And, and also solid science knowledge exhibits the three dimensions. So it's getting away from the idea that science knowledge is learning a lot of detailed facts. It really has to have this three-dimensional integrated fashion. What practices? Here, the, the change from the July document for those who saw it is this is more organized in kind of bigger groupings of practices. As you look at this list, it's listed as science and engineering, but only for a few is there a differentiation. So if you look at the first one, asking questions, that's the beginning of doing science, right? Asking questions to try and figure out what's happening in this system, what's going on. Uh, in engineering, the beginning of an engineering process is to define what problem you're trying to design something to solve. So defining problems is the engineering equivalent of the scientific questioning, asking questions. But developing and using models, that's something both scientists and engineers need to do. Planning and carrying out investigations, both of them need it, etc. When we get to number six, developing explanations, that's the goal in science, to develop an explanation of some phenomenon. And the goal in Engineering is to design that thing which provides the solution to the problem you've defined. So there again, some separation. But all the other practices are common to both fields. And therefore, we don't have to describe them separately for engineering and for science. And that's why it makes sense to put science and engineering together. Because a good part of what is done is common. And also, from the point of view of students learning science, applying their knowledge in an engineering design project is as important an element of learning to manipulate and, and use that knowledge as is doing investigations in science. So it's not that we're covering all you need to know to be an engineer. We're taking that part of engineering, which we think is really complementary and works to support science learning and putting it into this document. Cross, I, I will come back to discussing particular practices as we, as we get to questions. I think it's probably better to get through the, the big picture and then get into the details. Cross-cutting concepts. What are they? Things like noticing patterns, noticing similarity and differences, classification and, and differentiation. That's a big idea in science. It applies no matter what area of science you're thinking about. Cause and effect, of course, is that's what we're trying to develop explanations for in most cases in science. What causes this phenomenon? Scale, proportion and quantity plays out all of you're starting to investigate a phenomenon, you have to think about at what scale do I need to investigate in order to answer this question. You have to understand how scale affects the way systems behave or proportion and measure and quantity is very important in trying to figure out how to really define what you're looking at. So all the things that come with defining units and thinking about how about ratios, quantities, for example, density, right? A measure is a ratio of two incommensurate things. Kids have problems with that. Not just like a fraction, it's something different. It's a scientific idea you have to understand and it's part of the practice of science to be able to deal with those kinds of things. Systems thinking, 
in all of science, whenever you're investigating anything, you're investigating some system. And there are certain questions about systems, like what are its components and how do they interact with one another and what role does each of them play, that are common no matter what kind of system you're looking at. And so understanding that language and using the same language across different areas of science is part of the connective tissue, not only of science, but of science learning for students, that they have a common language and can apply it, and habitually will c come and ask those questions, because they've met them so many times that they automatically use them again, is part of developing scientific habits of mind, just as much as doing scientific investigation is part of developing scientific habits of mind. So having those common terminology across disciplines, and one of the things we worked hard on, energy and matter, it's sub-ideas under physical sciences. But when you teach it in physical sciences and you teach it in biology, it often looks so different that students find it hard to see any connection between what they've learned over here and how they're supposed to be used it over there. And so trying to find a way to express the ideas across the fields so that the language could be common and so that the commonality of ideas is stressed rather than buried was a very important piece here. Okay, now coming to the disciplines. How did we decide what's a core idea? We made ourselves a set of criteria and these criteria an idea didn't have to satisfy every one of these criteria to be a core idea, but it certainly had to satisfy more than one of them. And some of them change the list, right? Because we're talking about core ideas for science learning K-12, not what are the core ideas if I'm a physicist doing physics. And that means the, the, sec the last two criteria are as important as the first two criteria that the thing should in some way be relatable to student interest. That doesn't mean kids come into the room with this interest, but there has to be something that they're interested in that this can connect to. And it has to also, to be a core idea in the sense of this document, be something that's big enough to be taught and learned successively and iteratively over multiple years. So core ideas are big ideas, they're not the little bits and pieces. Okay, and we did this in the four disciplines, the same four that we had the design teams for. Let's start, now how did I get to the life sciences? Physical sciences, I must have skipped that one. Here are the, the ones in the physical sciences. The first three are the ones you would expect. Right? Matter and energy and forces in motion. Matter, energy, forces in motion. Those are every physicist and every chemist would say, I can see physics and chemistry in that. But waves and their applications in technology for information transfer, that's an effort to bring the connection to real world experience and also to highlight something different about light and sound than you do when you put it in under energy, right? When you talk about light and sound as, as forms of energy, you're ignoring the fact that they're major carriers of information. And it's as carriers of information that we interact with them, both you're sitting in this room seeing and hearing, which is what part of it, but, but also all modern information te technology or most modern information technology is dealing with either light or sound and our understanding of those how light and sound interact with matter is fundamental to being able to develop the devices we're using in this room for me to show you these pictures and project my voice to you, etc. So putting that as a, as a fourth core idea gives a little different twist. For the life sciences, again, oh, I, each time I go through these ideas, different points need to be made. One of them is a core idea is not a unit. It's neither a unit in the sense that you're going to teach this one core idea and separate it from the other core ideas, nor is it a unit in the sense that it's a certain amount of learning. The fact that there are four here and four there doesn't necessarily mean you're spending the same time in every grade on each of these areas. It depends 
where you are in the sequence, how much of one and how much of another. And we have not defined courses. We have not defined how this gets organized into curriculum. We have simply said, this is what should be learned. How organizing how to learn it and, and developing a curriculum in which it will be learned is quite another task. The committee had to work very hard to stop itself from wanting to write curriculum. Right? And there's a number of times in the committee meeting we say, that's not framework, that's curriculum, we, and pull ourselves back. So there are things that people criticize for not having in there, like history of science. Well, that's going to be introduced to the level of how you decide to present this information. Or specifically talking things that need to be in curriculum but are not here in the list of core ideas. One of them is the ethical implications of what you do and the nature of... And, and I see that as an issue which is critically important in curriculum but not something I want people writing standards about necessarily. So that's why it's not in the framework document even though it's important for curriculum. So there are distinctions between framework and curriculum which need to be understood in reading what is and what isn't in this document. The other thing, uh, the order of things doesn't mean an order of importance. I think most biologists today would say the most important idea in biology today is biological evolution. And so some biologists wanted us to put, some of our reviewers wanted us to make that number one. But we felt that we, to develop the ideas and present them at, at, even at the 12th grade level, it made more sense to organize them in this order. So we gave them in this order. So we start with organisms, we go to ecosystems, then hereditary, her, heredity, inheritance and variation due to inheritance, and then biological evolution. In Earth, Earth and space sciences, the first core idea is obviously the space piece, Earth and the rest of the universe. The second is a big one because it's all Earth systems and it's got a lot in it because it goes through basically you know, the, the geosphere, the, the atmosphere, the, the how do we call it, the water. <laughs> We, we, we were criticized in one doc document for not adding the cryosphere, but I consider the ice. Uh, it, it, I considered that part of the hydrosphere, which is the water. Uh, the biosphere, all of those are part of the Earth systems and how they interact. So another question people ask is, where's environmental science? It's both in the life sciences and in the Earth sciences because the biosphere and how it interacts with the, with the other systems of Earth is an important part of environmental science. And then for, again, because we're talking about what students should know and what are the core ideas of Earth sciences, the connection of Earth and human activity, both in terms of natural hazards and in terms of human impacts on Earth, is an important idea for students to understand. And so that pu pulled out as another core idea where it might not be if you were just saying from the point of view of the discipline of earth sciences what are the core ideas of the discipline. So that's the three that you sort of would expect. Now let's go to the engineering and technology. Engineering, technology and application of science. The first one is engineering. Now you might have said but I just saw engineering design under the practices so why do you need a core idea? And this, in fact, was a discussion we had. But the point is, when you do engineering practices, there's a certain amount of engineering knowledge that you need in order to engage effectively in those practices. So what this core idea delineates is the engineering knowledge you need in order to engage effectively in the practice of design. And it's a small piece of engineering. We're not pretending we're covering all that you think about when you think about engineering. But the piece that you needed in order to do the engineering practice, which we think is so important for science learning, we put that here. And then finally, as a core idea, that one must think about the links between science, technology, and, and engineering, and the applications of science in our lives. And of course, engineering 
mediates between science and technology. Science advances in part because technology advances. It's not a one-way street that science provides new technology. New technologies provide new science opportunities. And so the, the, the deep interaction between the two and the fact that, that so many things in the world that American students live, meet today come from the application of science through technology to their everyday lives is, is an important piece which we think they need some, some fundamental understandings of. Okay, that's the framework. And then we go on to our chapters about how to use this document. So integrating the dimensions, a very strong point, the one I made before, that a science lesson is not a lesson about practice or a lesson about this little piece of knowledge. It's solid in these three dimensions. It connects, say, systems thinking with a particular ecosystem that you're studying and a particular science practice for investigating or talking about or arguing whether the evidence supports a particular claim about this ecosystem. So the whole interweaving of these things is illustrated by some examples. And we instruct standards developers that they should develop performance expectations that require students to do that interweaving. Then we list these components and we have a little discussion about what needs to be done for each of them to be aligned with this framework. And all of them will require substantial effort. None of this can happen overnight. Any individual teacher can take pieces of this and start using it tomorrow. But for the system as a whole to use it effectively, all of these pieces need ongoing and iterative work to create a coherent and aligned system of science education, which I don't think you can say we have today. Uh, we have a chapter on, if we're talking about science for, for all students, we have to take into account issues of diversity. And, and diversity of learners, diversity of language background, diversity of community and cultural background that students come with, and, and how this is important. First of all, the key and critical piece is opportunity to learn. How can students learn science if they're not presented? And when one of our committee members had an example of working with two school districts in Washington State and they were talking about parts of a cell and one group had microscopes where they could see the cell and the other group you had to pretend you were seeing the cell because the microscopes were not of a quality where you could see the cell. So the whole issue of what it takes to have an opportunity to learn we discuss here. We also discuss the, the various elements of instruction that you have to think about how you're dealing with equity and how you're dealing with bringing all students into the conversation to become science learners and to gain the interest in learning science that they need in order to be effective learners. We give explicit, there are 13 explicit recommendations to standards developers and I I must say, having spent a couple of days in a meeting where Stephen Pruitt kept coming and sitting beside me, and he's the person in charge of this process at Achieve, uh, they really want to listen to this framework and, and, and do what we're recommending. So th we have explicit instructions to them. Uh, and then we say, you know, this is not the end. We think there's going to be iterations, and in order for the next committee charged with doing this to have better evidence on which to base the decisions they're making about what should go where and what's important and what should change from what we've done. There needs to be in research in the intervening time. And so we discuss various areas where research is needed. Which brings us to the end of the document. These are the things we changed. I don't think it matters all that much unless you're a person who spent a lot of time reading the July draft, in which case you're, you care. And obviously putting out the framework is the end of the process for this committee, but it's by no means the end in terms of what the job is that this committee undertook. 
right? The, the framework I see as a beginning, a beginning of a next iteration at trying to do better at science education in this country. And I think the document probably has value in other countries too. That's my, uh, I, I will pronounce the word as, as Murray Gelman told me I should, hubris, instead of hubris. But uh, the, to have some influence in this country, I think, is, is struck, the, the document is structured into a process that will give it influence. But if it's, an, if it's a document which does the job we hope and think it does, I think it also has value beyond that process. And I hope you will all find so too. So I'll stop there and then go back to wherever you want me to go in answer to questions. Dead silence. <laughs> Assessment is an open question at this point. I think a lot of people are thinking about it, and a, a lot is determined by the way that she writes performance expectations. So there's a conversation going on between achieve and people who know something about assessments. For example, if I write a performance expectation that has three dimensions to it, can you assess all three dimensions separately? So we're posing challenges in the assessment world because we think they need to be challenged. Right? And, and there's, there's no system yet for what will happen in terms of assessment. If multiple states adopt these standards, there will be a demand, just as there are the smart balance curriculum and the park curriculum for the common core of that when we the judge, there will be some kind of process. But there will be any federal money we all know where the federal budget is right now. <laughs> so it's, it's very unfun, but it's obviously critical because unless the assessment system is driving in the same direction as we're expressing here, then teachers will be in a horrible mind because they're being told they should be doing this and measured for that. It doesn't make any sense. So that's one of the places where there's a lot of work but, but definitely <laughs> the, the intent of this document and the intent of everybody working in this process is this should drive to a different kind of assessment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Not every teacher is a science teacher, so how would you address teacher competencies and achievement levels? Yeah, so let me go back to if we're talking elementary school, and we're saying science should be done in K2, and we're saying every student, every teacher should begin in K2 introducing their students to all of these practices, that's clearly a professional development challenge. And, and some of those people will feel confident that they know already some, how to do something. Others, would, like modeling, I think is one that's relatively new. So there'll be a process. I don't expect it to happen overnight, but I do expect that helping, so that's why we talk about pre-service and in-service professional development as being key pieces that have to be aligned to make this work. It is a challenge to the system, but I think it also helps an elementary teacher see how to think about teaching science in a way that just say, this is the knowledge that your children should be getting, does it? So, but there are questions about it for the system about it. Like, should every teacher be teaching science? Or should we have some other, perhaps starting in fourth grade, some more specialization among elementary teachers? Those are open questions. I don't know the answers to them. But having every teacher teach science, K-5, puts a tremendous <coughs> learning demand on those teachers when they also have to learn how to do better teaching math and how to do better teaching language arts. On the other hand, there's a lot of synergy. 
look at practices number five and eight. Those are direct links to the Common Core Mathematics and the Common Core Language Arts. Teaching, obtaining information is not only reading, it's going to the web and obtaining information, but, but being able to read science texts is different from being able to read literature. You have to coordinate diagrams and text, for example, which is something a science teacher can teach, but a reading teacher may not have thought of. So there are many pieces here where uh, it will definitely push the system, and it's intended to push the system. One of the challenges for us as a committee was to say, when are we creating a bridge too far? How far can, how ambitious can we be and not break the system? Right? So the notion that all this happens tomorrow will break the system. Right? The notion that this is a path for an evolution over time for the system, I think, allows you to say, okay, these will be supports and not barriers to teach yourself to, to define it in this way. That's my hope for the anyway. You can tell I'm an incredible optimist. <laughs> yes? Yeah, how does this approach differ from countries that seem to be doing well, like South Korea? In many ways, we, first of all, we looked at internationally, Achieve actually did an international comparison of, of science document, documents. What's taught when, it's all over the map. But what is common to countries that do well is coherence is having the idea that students, what they learned this year builds on what they learned the previous year and, and builds ideas over the time in, in a coherent fashion. And approach to science practice, it's there, but it's not slightly different in a place. So it's hard to say, well, everybody does this, and so that's the magic bullet. There are no magic bullets, I'm afraid. Yes, okay. So it's very encouraging um, to see the chapter 11, and I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but the, the issues and the things that came out about diversity and equity. Mm -hmm. um, and then I noticed on the future suggestion for future research, um, there wasn't a connection to that. Is there there actually that? is in the chapter. So I'd love to, could you share some insight into the discussion that went into um, perhaps the research that might be helpful to help illuminate issues around diversity and equity in science? Well, I mean, some of the research, some of the things we already know, right? So we already know that opportunity to learn is obviously crucial, and that it's not uniformly distributed. Right? So some of it is just obvious what needs to be done. Unfortunately, making it happen is another story altogether. The question about how do you teach inclusively? How do you take a class of children that come from five different cultures and two or three different language groups with maybe a few odd students from five or seven others and teach in a way that's supporting all of them? And that's a tremendous challenge. And I think, yes, every individual person figures out for themselves to some extent, but I think there's space for research there. We talk about I'd like to ask a question related to that. Um, because diversity and equity was specifically highlighted on the uh, translating the standards portion. Um, and I'm having trouble picturing how standards would integrate uh, matters of diversity and equity into the kinds of performance statements that you're talking about. It's thinking about multiple ways of demonstrating knowledge, for example, so that an English language learner can demonstrate what they understand even though their English is somewhat limited. So they, well, again, we're, we're pushing the system and saying to the standards developers, in writing the performance expectations, you need to think about these things too. But we're saying that that is one of the pieces of understanding how to make a system that serves more students better. Creating a 
walks the white and have an opportunity to display and build upon their outside of the site acumen and how that can translate in terms of the workforce, in terms of the business development, in terms of just basically being able to fill a really wide uh, gap of jobs that have science related things, things like moves okay so here i'm stepping outside my my role in this committee which i only looked at k-12 okay. and, and talking from the perspective of things i've learned in the board on science education we actually have a study going on, on community college science but from the framework point of view having career and college <laughs> typically really means ready to enter community college right too many students graduate high school today and go into remediation because they're not ready to enter from here to come. So, and, and science is a piece of that. It's not a core piece, but it's a supportive piece in that, and here again, I'm, I'm now saying giving opinion, not committee uh, material, but uh, being an effective learner process disciplines. And if a student can get engaged and become an effective learner in one discipline, it moves them ahead in the other disciplines too. So that, that if science is offered and becomes a pathway for some students into wanting to learn, that's a very important piece of goal to think about science. And, and I know that can happen. I've seen it happen with projects that, that function that way. Uh, so, this is a piece of the role of opportunity in the world. That, that saying, oh no, those students are not ready for science, is denying an opportunity to learn that can actually help make them ready for, for a community college. What community college, role community college serves is really important for a very large sector of community. And when we're talking about all students, Career in college <coughs> having to know by the end of high school means ready to go on whatever path in life is the right path for you. It certainly includes for many students in college as a path to a career. Um, I have a question being someone who kind of grew up with the other framework and, and uh, really taking that very seriously to heart. From your point of view, what does this framework, um, you talked about the framework being a vision. What is clear in the vision now? What has fallen away from sight? What do you think are the, the uh, really uh, added pieces or different pieces to this framework that don't, I heard, I heard, um, that don't necessarily tie specifically to day and time. Mm -hmm. That makes any sense? I know you've got a ways uh, section in physical science, and you, you also talked about um, uh, one other thing that was really the But the human the human interactions with us. Uh, yeah. No, right? no, the engineering and science marriage. That's that's a little if bit. If you hard. actually look at national science education science standards, they have a, a section on, what is it the topic, what was it called? Technology, it, it's an engineering piece, it's science in, and its applications in the world, or? Yeah, it's both content and classes about technology. Right, so is this there? The, the question is not really how does our vision differ from the vision 15 years ago, because I think in fact the vision is not all that different. What's different is we have 15 years of experience in how that played out. And we're trying to define it better and move it forward in, in a more structured way. For example, in National Science Education Standards, I would say the vision of science as inquiry is more in the standards for teaching than it is in the what should students learn. And so the, the, this is the way science should be learned, rather than this is what students should learn. And by moving it and saying, no, these practices are something students need to be able to demonstrate that they can do, 
we're taking it out of this is a choice about pedagogy and putting it into this is something we think students need to do in order to learn science. And that's a different twist, but it's not really a different vision. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth and I agree with me about that. But no, mm -hmm. I, I would say that the practices, if you contrast inquiry and practices, um, both mm -hmm. the what kids need to learn and the uh, how they need to learn, mm -hmm. I think are considerably clearer and cleaner here. It's not just the kind of gloppy, um, just explore things just a bit. I just want to say a great example of kids that don't feel wax for a um, yep. that, That's just sort of the follow the dream kind of a thing. And this is like really. So the idea that you have to start with finding something you're interested in and take it wherever you do for our own education, who cares what strategies and techniques you learn. And then the other one is, for my money, um, the uh, practice of. Uh, I know which one she likes. <laughs> <laughs>
this was a great concern of the committee, that people would not just try everything else and go back to the details. It's really that, you know, the learning sciences and, and the whole question of, of learning progression research builds a different vision of what it means to learn science. It's not just about learning the facts. Now, lots of people have that vision already, but the assessments are all guaranteed, oriented to how many details you know. Whereas, to my mind, serious understanding in science is not about knowing all the details, but about knowing in what context to use the knowledge you have and how to apply it and how to investigate a new situation when we come to it. So uh, going into uh, an ecosystem and learning the Latin names of every plant has value for certain purposes. But if you want to understand ecosystems, it's pretty useless. And it doesn't take you any further when you get to the next ecosystem, which is totally different. Like when I immigrated from Australia to the US, everything I knew about the names of all the plants in Australia wasn't particularly useful to me. And so that what knowledge has power to move you forward and allow you to acquire new knowledge? Because we all know that in the modern world you have to be an ongoing learner. And it's the knowledge that has power to move you forward that we stress here. And we hope that that, that message will get through. But systems always react in strange ways. So I can look at this side of the room for a while. Us. It seemed that you put more emphasis on learning progressions in the draft. Can you talk about the shifts there? Or ah, it's a change of language. Uh, Why the change of language to break band endpoints instead of hypothetical learning progressions? Partly because the learning pro progression researchers objected. They said a learning progression is the integrated thing. It's not the knowledge side of it. So talking about using the term learning progression for something that was just content really got them upset at us. <laughs> and so it's partly a, a, a terminology thing, but it's also because we, we really were pulling back in terms of what belonged in the framework. We put a lot more detail in the draft at that level, partly because we hadn't had time to sort out what belonged in the framework and what didn't. And, and then we pulled back and we said, no, we'll describe the top level idea in a coherent fashion, and then we'll do some, some markers for the grade band endpoints. We won't try and describe the detail of what you have to do to get to those grade band endpoints. And so that was, that was more a matter of, that's not the job of the framework. From your perspective of this sort of knowledge of the standards, would you describe an example of um, a lesson that you would give, give in a classroom, say a seventh grade classroom in the assessment that would go with it? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Just on the bottom. I know. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 Question. The question is, what would be a lesson I'd give in a seventh grade classroom? <laughs> right? I mean, in California right now, seventh grade is life sciences, and that's not really my <laughs> 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 physical I can do physical sciences. So I'm dealing with matter, and by eighth grade, students need to be understanding atoms and molecules. Right? And in the context of atoms and molecules, I want them to understand something about energy, right? So this is a very tricky subject, energy and chemistry. Chem in chemical reactions, energy appears and disappears, it seems, right? So how can I link my understanding of energy in chemical reactions and energy as motion, right? And it's really that I've got to get to some notion of stored energy. Right? So we can we can find processes and we can actually do them where there's a chemical reaction which gives off heat or a chemical reaction that makes things cold. Right? And we're going to do both those things and we're going to talk about what's happening in the context of energy. And also, to some extent, 
how it is appropriate for those reactions to let those students know what's happening in terms of molecules and atoms. Right? And so trying to just construct the lesson, and I'm not going to construct the whole lesson, that's linking those two ideas in terms of something the students are actually doing and measuring. And then discussing, does the evidence support that chemical reactions are releasing energy? Does the energy support that the other chemical reaction is somehow taking away energy from the motion of the, of the atoms around it? Right? And, and then what, what explanations do students offer? What models would they make for those processes? And how do their models interpret what they measure and they see? So very explicitly bringing in the language of models, bringing in that they have to develop their own explanation and support it with argumentation, but into a lesson which is trying to link two big ideas. Yeah, that's an ambitious lesson. Right? But you can do that in eighth grade if you've been working with models for a while. You can't do it if they haven't ever used a model. So building, the, like one of the criticisms this document got from the people who lost that quickly and wanted to say something at the, at the release was, I think your targets for K2 are too low. But when you look at this, and you look at the cross-cutting ideas, and you realize those start K2, then your targets for games are not too low. We're dealing with the observable world and doing investigation and doing argument and evidence and doing developing your own explanations. You can do very rich things when you're only dealing with stuff that's at the observable scale. Yes. Is this framework then really like itself in the performance-based assessments and that's kind of the goal of it? But when you're assessing That's certainly one way of assessing it. We're talking about going to performance expectations, but a performance expectation of which doesn't necessarily mean performance based assessment. So the challenge of making an assessment, so we actually give two examples of performance tasks where we work at across the grade levels for the same general idea of what the is matter and energy in the living system. And one of them is, is basically the, the understanding of matter. And, and show how you would set a task, which might be a written task, but ask students to bring in either their model or their arguments for what it is, or one or other of these practices. And also ask them to use reference to what the cross cutting ideas are to look at. So, we we'll give a couple of examples. I think those things can be constructed. It's going to take the assessment for a lot of work. And therefore, I don't expect that the first round of assessments will be satisfactory. And this is a I think it's going to take a lot before we're at the place where we, we can look at the assessments and say, yes, we're really measuring all three dimensions in an effective way for students and all the others that perform. So I have a question about the politics. <laughs> so, you know, this national standards came out in the 90s, and that was after Science for All America in the 80s, and that was 30 years after this question. And you say the vision for this document, which looks like a pretty good document, uh, is similar to all of those others. But we saw No Child Left Behind basically ignoring science, and you see, you know, report after report of the importance of the more or less overlooking. So, from, from your point of view and from the board's point of view, what does the future of this having a different effect look like? There's, there's two positive factors. The, the negative factor, of course, is, is the money situation. The, the chances of anything new happening right now are, are pretty great. So, immediately, that's a problem. In the long run, there's two, two factors that, that are in the, the national and the state conversation. The state conversation is, and it, it depends a lot on how this plays out in the common core math and language arts, that by states working together, they can 
do better with the same amount of money. In, that's the that's the philosophy, for example, of the large assessment. So in here, not that it will be cheaper for each state to do the assessment, because but because each state isn't paying separately for assessments which are more or less the same. Putting all that money together, you can buy better assessments. So the idea that multiple states working together has some economies of scale which are effective on a system-wide level in terms of curriculum development, in terms of assessment development, in terms of teacher professional development even, uh, teacher in pre-service training. If you've got a common view, pre-service training can be more effective. Uh, so all of those things lead to a political moment which has more states interested. I mean, I'm astounded that 20 states have signed up to work with Achieve. That says, this, uh, 44 states in the District of Columbia now have adopted common standards in language arts, and I think it's 43 in the District of Columbia in math. So if of those states, there are 20 of them turning around and saying, now we want to do it in science too, or we want to at least think about it seriously, that means there's a political moment for working together, which wasn't there. When the National Science Education Standards came out, it was a national document with, without a national following. And every state did what it did, either saying, oh, this is useful, we can do it. California said, basically, we're in opposition to this and we'll develop assets. It was a very political process in California. And, and at least part of that process was in opposition to the vision of the National Science Education Standards, not trying to implement. So obviously there will be states that don't adopt. Some of them because they don't believe in national standards for anything, and those are the ones that haven't adopted common core and math and language arts either. But other states because there's something in this document. For example, being the National Academy, we put in what we think is important in science. That means we put in evolution and we put in global climate change. Right? And There'll be states where those things are considered controversial and may affect the ch choice of a state to adopt it. But if multiple states adopt it, I think there will be some resources by then because the other political message is our nation, international competitiveness depends on having workers who are scientifically and technically competent. And that does not just mean scientists and engineers. It means people in all levels of jobs having a level of competence so that they can compete and get salaries at the level that support the standard of living in this country. So the political pressure, the national need thing, which I put at the bottom of the list because teachers see it as the bottom of the list, it politically it's very important because it gives political weight behind we need students doing better in these fields because it matters for our economy. And so where, wherever you're coming from, those two factors will play a role. And, and that's why I say there is an opportunity now to move things forward a step. I don't expect magic, but I do expect that, that this document will have influence and, and will play out various ways, in different ways in different states, but will we'll definitely influence how people think about science teaching in, in the, the coming years. Yes. State and national politics are, are certainly very important, but ultimately um, this document and its authors need to convince individual instructors. Um, who, uh, as someone said earlier, uh, have invested a great deal of time and energy in making changes that are in alignment with the, the previous standards, the AAAS document and the NR, uh, earlier NRC document. Um, and so it seems to me that the PR aimed at individual instructors um, is very important. I gave a webinar for NSTA which had 700 people. A record, their previous record was less than 200. So, uh, 
teachers are obviously interested, they care, this is going to affect them. Uh, Buy-in will happen because we convince them that this will make their job better, make their work more effective. Right? And, and yes, I don't think this happens just automatically. I think that has, so one of the reasons why we call NSTA partners in this group is we expect that part of that work needs to be carried by other organizations. And, and the, the need for, to help teachers see how what they've been doing does align with this and where it needs to change in effective ways. To see this as evolution and not revolution, I think is very important. And, and I think it is. I really seriously consider the, the changes which happened because of the National Science Education Standards move the system to a point where this is a next step that you can take. Whereas if you started without those that work that people have been doing to adapt to them, it would be harder for them to get to this. And I keep this one up because, as Elizabeth said, this is one of the bigger changes to make this explicit and, and to demand not just, I mean, planning and carrying out investigations is a piece, but stopping there is not science practice. Right? Particularly if you don't analyze and interpret your data. <laughs> <laughs> so putting these things down and saying, look, you have to do all of these things, and iteratively and recursively, it's not a linear process, it's, it's a recursive learning process, is, is very, very important to make it clear, not only for the teachers, but also for parents and outside the system to understand what is it that my kid is learning. And to look at this and say, oh yeah, I want my kid to be able to do that. A few will say, I don't like it, I do <laughs> That's a part of the education process. Thank you. I've exhausted